Thomas, thank you very much for being here. Looking forward to listening to your talk. Thank you. Hello, thanks for staying so late. <laughs> Um, we're going to talk about Solana and its JIT compiler and a couple of lessons we learned from fuzzing it. Um, first off, I'm Thomas Roth. I'm a security researcher. I lead uh, something called Kraken Security Labs, which is the security research division of Kraken. Normally, you know, we do things like play Doom on Bitcoin ATMs, hack hardware wallets, uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, but before we get started, there are a couple of people we need to say thank you to. So, for example, the Solana team, um, who are pretty good sports about all of this. Um, then Secret Club's Edison uh, deserves a lot of recognition, as you will see later. And also the AFL++ team, who uh, were nice enough to help me out a couple of times. Now, before we get into the fuzzing part, let's quickly talk about Solana. So, Solana self-describes itself as a high-performance blockchain, which means one of their main goals is to execute as many transactions per, per second as possible. If you look at, for example, Ethereum, you normally execute like, you know, a couple of transactions per, per second, but on Solana, their goal is like thousands of transactions per second. Now, on top of Solana, you can run smart contracts. And if you've worked with, let's say, Ethereum before, you probably know that normally those contracts are written in domain-specific languages. So, for example, on Ethereum, it would be Solidity um, and so on. But on Solana, instead, you can write your contracts in C, C++, and Rust, and so on, which is pretty cool, and it's pretty cool how they implemented it. And we are going to take uh, quite a deep look at that. Solana is a proof of stake slash proof of history um, blockchain, and so um, no mining involved. Instead, we uh, have so called servers that are called validators that basically achieve the consensus on the network, and everyone can become a validator. It's basically just a beefy server, you know, like 12, uh, 12 cores, 128 gigs of RAM, um, and anyone can basically participate in that. At any time in the Solana cluster, one of the validators is elected the leader. Um, this is just a high-level description. The details are a bit more involved, but basically at each time we have one leader, and that leader is basically in control of the order and the way the transactions are executed. And so basically if we submit transactions to you know, the Solana network, they would all arrive at the leader, and the leader would then basically decide on which order the, these get executed in, then it would you know, run the transactions, execute the smart contracts and so on, and then publish first of the order uh, in which the executions were, uh, sorry, the transactions were executed, and then finally a hash of the, of the state of, let's say, the chain after they got executed. Then all the other validators basically take the order that was published, they execute the same transactions again, and they validate that indeed they get the same hash. Now, the leader position always rotates through, and so if, if we have, for example, a malicious leader, eventually it will get ejected. Um, and so, for example, if our leader would publish um, a malicious state, uh, or, well, a faked state, then the validators could say, hey, we don't agree, and basically eject the leader. Um, that's just on the chain side, but what we are really interested in are the actual smart contracts. Now, Solana smart contracts are can be written in C and C++, but most that you will actually see are written in Rust. Um, Rust, I think, is a pretty good choice because you know you get all those nice safety features. You have uh, memory safety. You have uh, a lot of other things that you really want to have when your code is literally dealing with a lot of money, um, and so it's a pretty good choice. Rust is a compiled language, and so as a compiled language, we also need a target. And in the case of Solana. Um, they choose eBPF as the target format. And so instead of you know, directly compiling to, let's say, x64 and run the smart contracts natively on the validators, they compile into eBPF. And so a smart contract is literally, in this case, an eBPF L file, just as you would find on Linux or whatever. Um, and yeah, if you're not familiar with eBPF, eBPF stands for Extended Berkeley Packet Filter. Um, basically, it's used in the Linux kernel and also, you know, on like BSD for um, for network filtering, for packet filtering. That's where the name comes from. And it's a pretty simple risk machine, like 64-bit risk machine, fixed length instructions. And in the Linux kernel, we actually have a full BPF VM. And so, um, if you do packet filtering. In the Linux kernel, there's like a just-in-time compiler, a program verifier, and it runs those BPF programs. Um, the BPF machine is pretty simple. It's just 10 registers and a frame pointer. 
Uh, the instructions are 64 bits wide, and the encoding is super simple. You have one encoding that's just the default encoding for all instructions, and then you can also optionally have like basically 128 bit wide instruction that where you have a 64 bit immediate value. We just have your regular instruction classes such as load and store and just some basic arithmetic. It's really not much magic and as you will see, we don't really have to understand BPF too much to actually find vulnerabilities with it. Um, and if you work in security, for me, I mainly know BPF from CVEs and so I mainly know it as something that has a lot of uh, vulnerabilities in general. And so when I read that Solana uses eBPF, I got pretty curious how they do it um, securely, basically. Now, the eBPF ELF that you generate from your, you know, your Rust code is basically directly uploaded to the blockchain. So you can dump the program and you will just get a regular ELF file. There's no you know, special custom encoding or so, which is pretty nice because you can use all the existing tooling for ELF files on those smart contracts. You don't need like, all the domain-specific stuff, basically. Um, now, a couple of more things we need to know about Solana smart contracts is if you've worked with Solidity, so for example, if you've ever written an Ethereum smart contract, you probably know that Ethereum contracts store their own state. And so if you have a global variable in Solidity, the value of that variable is stored as part of the contract, basically. And for example, here we have this public variable, just text, which uh, has the state hello. And if we were to submit a transaction that calls the function foo, that state of the contract would get updated. This is not how Solana works. Solana contracts are completely stateless and they don't have their own storage, basically. The way um, you actually interact with data is that you have separate files, basically, that are called accounts. And these accounts basically pay rent to not get deleted. And so it's pretty nice because if you, you know, download a smart contract, you have all the state you need because there is none. Um, but you still need to figure out what files on the chain and so on does the contract actually interact with. Now, the L file itself, it's a shared object. And shared objects, in the way Solana uses them, have one big caveat. You can't have any writable global variables, simply because you know, the shared object gets loaded once. If you, execute a if you execute multiple transactions that run the same contract, you want to make sure that you, the state of your, uh, of your in-memory shared object doesn't, state, uh, doesn't change. And so we don't have any writable global variables. On the memory side, it's pretty simple. Basically, the ELF just gets put at a fixed address, hex 1000. The stack starts at hex 2000, heap at 3000, and finally, we have something called program input at hex 4000. The program input is basically just a byte array, and if you execute a transaction that calls into the contract, the byte array is basically the argument towards the smart contract. So you don't call like functions by name or so, instead you just provide a byte array and it gets somehow parsed by our ELF file. <coughs> now, the ELF file, once, an uh, no, once a contract gets executed, gets run by the Solana VM. And if you build a VM for like, let's say BPF, you have two choices. You can either write an interpreter for BPF or you write a just-in-time compiler. Now, an interpreter has a lot of advantages in terms of safety because, you know, you don't generate native code. You can very easily sandbox it all. Um, but it obviously has a performance impact. And as Solana cares a lot about high performance, it's very probable that they use a just-in-time compiler. And just-in-time compilers historically have been a security issue, let's say. They're pretty difficult to get right. And that's just because of the concept of them. If you do just-in-time compilation, you basically take BPF code and you somehow generate native instructions. And if you're not very careful that you know somebody can't generate random instructions that they can freely choose, then you can very easily get into deep trouble because basically the compiler will just write into memory, then map that memory as executable and run it. And so if you're not very careful, your JIT code might just exploit your existing um, like basically the process it, it's running in. You also need to bring your own memory safety. So let's say I have BPF code that accesses memory at, I don't know, address zero. I want to make sure that this memory access doesn't actually happen on the, let's say, physical process address zero, and instead you want to catch it and so on. And this is all a lot of work, and it's fairly difficult to really do this securely because you just have 
a large list of things to do. And yeah, so this all sounds pretty interesting for some security research. And so we decided to look deeper into the virtual machine of Solana. Um, you can find the code online on github.com slash Solana Labs slash RBPF, contains the full machine. It's written in Rust, which is great because we get memory safety and so on. And if we check the readme, we also can see that indeed they chose to use a JIT compiler um, that only at the moment supports 64-bit x86. But just because the virtual machine contains a JIT compiler doesn't mean that it's actually used in the wild. And so we, we had to kind of dig through the code a bit um, and eventually just found that we should have just read the release notes because since last year in March, basically the JIT is enabled by default. For us, this is super interesting because it means, you know, everyone can upload smart contracts to the chain. If we manage to build a smart contract that can exploit the validators, we can do a lot of very malicious stuff. And so for us, this was super interesting. Also in the readme, we can see that, um, that Solana RBPF is a fork of RBPF from Quentin Monet. And if you see that something is based on something else, it's always good to go to the original source and check like, you know, issues, to-dos, CVEs, things they might have fixed. And in the case of RBPF, if we go to the GitHub repository, there are indeed a couple of interesting things. And so, for example, in the to-do list, there's literally a point, improve safety of JIT compiled programs with runtime memory checks. Hmm. Then you scroll further down and there's this section, what about safety? <laughs> and it literally says it will crash if your JIT compiled program tries to perform unauthorized memory accesses. Hmm. Now crash is a very wide range. Um, like crash can mean a lot. Like crash could mean, you know, a rust panic or crash could mean, oh, you can write into memory uh, and it, you know, sec falls. And also in the, sec for, uh, in the caveat section, there's a whole section called the JIT compiler produces an unsafe program. Memory accesses are not tested at runtime. Use with caution. Now we could go and you know manually check if, uh, if they added safety checks around this. Or we could do the lazy way and we just start fuzzing the VM and see what we find. And so I'm lazy, so I started fuzzing. Um, and fuzzing a VM is actually surprisingly simple, at, le at least in this case. To fuzz, let's say, uh, the Solana VM, all we need is some kind of input. So for example, a simple eBPF program. Then we start mutating it semi-randomly. So we just start flipping bits, adding bytes, removing bytes, and so on and so forth. And then we execute it in the Solana VM. Now, um, we want to get this all as performant as possible. And so the Solana VM, if we get lucky, we want to execute this multiple thousand times per second. And so we want to you know, try random mutations as fast as possible on as many machines in parallel as possible. And then hopefully, we you know, eventually crash the machine and we collect those crashes. And uh, if we get very lucky, uh, we can analyze them and we maybe find some nice vulnerabilities. That's the plan, and so let's get started. <coughs> now, first we need some simple eBPF programs. Now, if you want to fuss a VM, you want to be sure that you get a very wide variety of inputs. You know, you want to cover as many instructions as possible. In this case, we're looking at ELF. ELF in itself is already pretty complex, and so you want to have a lot of different ELF binaries, different types, and so on. And luckily, the RBPF um, code base contains test cases for a lot of things. And so we can just take these tiny binaries that are already made to be is almost the ideal fuzzing input, and we can just take them and feed them into our fuzzer um, or into the VM. And now one of the issues we encountered at this point is that we wanted to analyze these binaries. We want to, before we put them into the fuzzer, we want to look at the instructions that are generated for them. We want to look at what do they do? Do you really get the instruction coverage that we require? Um, which put, puts that at a place where we wondered how can we actually analyze them. At this point in time, there was simply no good reverse engineering tooling to actually look at the compiled output of a Solana smart contract. Um, now, there were like a disassembly that gives you a huge text dump, but that doesn't really help you because Solana contracts tend to be pretty, pretty complex and pretty large, and so you can easily have a lot of libraries in there, you can have a lot of dependencies and so on, and it's very easy for these to get very large, and you really want to have an interactive disassembler to work with them. 
I'm a big fan of Ghidra, and unfortunately, Ghidra does not come with uh, with native eBPF support. But uh, Nalin 98 built a processor module for BPF, and so with that we can already, you know, Ghidra understands the machine code, we can do patching, we can do all kinds of things. But we can't load Solana binaries yet, because Solana has this custom memory map, we have all these custom things that we need for Solana. And so we decided to write a completely custom loader based on this eBPF that basically sets up the memory map, finds the symbols if they are in, in the ELF file, um, and basically allows us to just drag and drop a Solana contract into Ghidra and analyze it. So for example, if we have a simple hello world binary, we can just uh, drag it into Ghidra, import it as Solana ELF file, hit OK, and then simply double click it and to load it into the code browser, run the regular analysis as you always do in Ghidra, then you go grab a coffee because analysis takes forever. And then once it's finished, we can just, you know, navigate through the binary, we get disassembly, and we even get decompilation of the full contract. Um, this is pretty nice because you can really, you know, dig through a contract. Um, the decompilation will not help us with analyzing the fuzzing results because those, you want to really look at the instructions. But this actually uh, helps us a lot with something else that's unrelated to actual virtual machine security, but that is important for us to be able to trust public contracts because verifiable builds are pretty important. If you think about like a lot of smart contract projects, you get like a link to GitHub and it's like the contract code is there, but you can't actually easily verify whether the contract code is identical to what's stored on chain. And so, for example, on Ethereum, if you go to Etherscan and you look at a contract, they have this thing um, called contract verification where you can just paste in your contract code, they will compile it with the same solidity version, and then they will tell you, yes, this is all verified. With Rust, it's not as easy. If you've done, you know, uh, reproducible builds with Rust before, it's not very easy, and so at the moment, most contracts on Solana, even the very big ones, are not verified. But with our Ghidra tooling, we kind of bring our own verification to the whole thing. So we can really just go, we can download you know, any contract from the chain. So, for example, using Solana program dump, you can literally just go and fetch the ELF file from the chain. So if we run file on this, you can see it's really just a regular 64-bit ELF file. And then we can drag it into Ghidra and hopefully, you know, analyze our contract. Now, obviously, we can't go and manually reverse engineer the entire contract because, you know, it's really, really large and really annoying. Um, however, what we can do is we can use the Ghidra program comparison to actually, compile, uh, to actually compare our manual compilation with what we find on chain and get a very clear picture if, you know, the code is really identical. Um, and so this really helps us because, you know, we sometimes need to trust contracts with quite a bit of money. So with that, we have our simple eBPF program, we have our analysis tools, and we are basically almost good to go. Next, um, we're gonna first look at the, at how we execute our simple program in the Solana VM, because we wanna get those parts running before we start mutating, so that we can be sure that everything is running. And it turns out that <coughs> this was really, really easy. So um, as said, our BPF is written in Rust, and so we can really just, you know, write a couple of lines of Rust to load our eBPF L file into memory. Then we parse the executable, um, we JIT compile it. This is just using the RPF API. You don't have to read the code. You can get the slides and read it on there. Um, I just want to show how short it actually is. And then um, we verify the executable. This step will be, uh, become important later. We create the virtual machine, and then we finally just go and run it. Simple as that. And so this is just like 20 lines of code, and you have all the base that you need to start fuzzing the VM. So with that, we have our eBPF program, we have our VM uh, test set up, almost good to go. Next we need to start mutating randomly. Now you could write your own fuzzer that's maybe even, you know, instruction set aware and so on and so forth, but there are people who are much better at writing fuzzer, fuzzers, especially the people at AFL++. And um, AFL++ is really nice because it has, you know, Rust support, we don't have to write our own uh, fuzzing infrastructure. It comes with native dual uh, core and multi-core support and so on and so forth. 
If you are not familiar with AFL++, it's a fork of, the, of Google's AFL. It's a bit faster, has better instrumentation, and it comes with Rust support. And the Rust support is amazing. It's super simple to use, and it's really, really fast. Also, AFL++ instruments the target binary, and so it's aware that as it goes through the JIT compiler, which branches has it taken, and it tries to automatically mutate the inputs to get as much coverage as possible. And so this allows us to really ensure that we get a wide range of the JIT compiler actually fast, because as we are fuzzing, it will see, oh, I haven't taken that branch yet, and so on and so forth. And it also comes with a nice UI, and it has features to, into, uh, to minimize test cases. So if we find a crash, and the crash is, the backtrace is basically identical to another crash, it will just you know, ignore it and save you a ton of work. And what's really nice is that the Rust integration for AFL++ is really just add a single macro to your code. Like we just remove the file loading, and we just add the fuzzing macro. It gives us a byte array with whatever fuzzing input we have and then we are ready to go. Now, because we are doing Rust, we also want to add a panic handler, because otherwise um, any Rust panic will be, will be counted as a crash, which we don't really care about, because we want to get memory corruption, not you know Rust panics. And with that, we are already you know, ready to go. We are basically ready to fuss with like 30 lines of code or so. Pretty awesome. And so I was pretty excited about this because, you know, you just let this run for a bit and hope for the best. And so you just, you know, started with Cargo AFL FUS. You provide a directory with inputs, which are just the example BPF programs. You provide an output directory with the, um, where basically the crashes and so on will be stored. And then you finally go and launch the binary. So let's do that. And now we are fuzzing. And if you are not familiar with AFL, um, it comes with this nice CLI. It tells you on the top basically the timing of your fuzzer. It tells you, okay, how long have I been running? What's the time since I last found a new path in the fuzzer, which is pretty important. It basically tells you, um, like, if, if this goes very high, it means it just didn't find a new um, executable path in the binary, and so you sh should probably stop fuzzing. Um, it also tells you, you know, how many crashes has it found, how many um, hangs and so on, and it tells you the execution speed. And so in this case, we are running at like 3,600 executions or so per second, which is pretty decent. If we let this run on like 12 cores for a couple of weeks, we get a lot, a lot, a lot of results. And so we had this running for a couple of hours, and then um, something nice happened. We found a crash. And Time to party, hopefully. <laughs> we'll see. And we let this run for a couple of weeks, uh, or a couple of days actually at first, and we got a lot of, a lot, a lot of crashes. Unfortunately, if you look closer at the crashes, they tell you which signal uh, caused the crash. Now, does anyone know what signal 08 is on Linux? Floating point exception. Doesn't really help us at all. It just means that we did something numeric wrong. No real luck. But however, all between the signal 08 are also three signal 11. And signal 11 is exactly what you want to find because signal 11 is a segmentation fault. And no matter what you do, a virtual machine should never cause a segmentation fault. So even if this is, like what, if you see a segmentation fault, it's most probably a vulnerability. So I was super excited. We get three segmentation faults. Let's start looking at them. And so, um, oops, sorry, I started executing them and my target binary wouldn't crash. Basically, I tried it again, 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 again. I wouldn't get a segmentation fault. I eventually wrote a script to simply run this like 10,000 times, and then it would only crash sometimes. What's going on? Well, it turns out that, you know, if I had read the AFL manual uh, to the end and not just skip to the good parts, they have this indication for something called stability. And basically, stability tells you how det deterministic your program is. Basically, if it executes the program with the same inputs twice, and it sees that different branches are taken, it reduces stability and tells you, like, hey, your binary is not deterministic. Something is sketchy. Like, for example, you might have an RNG that is uh, doing weird stuff. You might have uh, something else going on. But how could this not be deterministic? I mean, we are loading into a VM. We are running the same binary. What's going on? Well, it turns out that RBPF has this feature that introduces random knobs into the code. And, you know, it's on by default. And so that causes 
each time you run your program, it causes it to be slightly different in memory. And so obviously sometimes it would crash, sometimes it wouldn't crash, and so on. And simply by setting this to zero, suddenly our stability goes up to 98. Yay. <laughs> we actually can, can fuss nicely now. And indeed, after running this for, I think, 14 days, we had 59 segmentation falls. Yay. <laughs> now, this is the fun part. Because next you have to do something that is pretty difficult and pretty annoying. Namely, you have to triage your crashes. Now, luckily, we don't care about exploitation too much because, you know, for us, exploitation doesn't matter because we care about whether we have or we don't have a vulnerability. Um, we also don't really care about the severity too much because, again, like, if the VM crashes, that's an, an issue for us, that's a vulnerability. We don't really submit to bug bounties, we just want the vulnerability fixed. And so, for us, triaging is enough to say, okay, we have an out-of-bounds read or we have an out-of-bounds write. Yeah, we don't have to, to write a POC. Um, and even though we have all these limitations that makes triaging much, much easier, it's still quite difficult because if you think about it, you know, you have your eBPF bytecode. That eBPF bytecode gets JIT compiled by Rust code. That Rust code then emits native x64 instructions. Those native instructions then somehow get mapped into actual process memory. And we have symbols for the first two parts. And afterwards, it's basically just good luck. If you take one of the crashes and you run it in, let's say, GDB, and you know, we just run it with one of the segmentation faults we found, and we look at the backtrace, all you get is question marks. And that's not nice to reverse engineer, because you basically have to exactly know what was written at that address, by which function, and which instruction, which BPF instruction caused this, and so on. It's pretty terrible, to be honest. And the same with LLDB. LLDB, if we debug with it, we get basically the same, but it doesn't even give us a backtrace, and so we are just stuck somewhere in, in no man's land. But at least it tells us kind of uh, what type of access caused the fault, like whether it's a read or a write, and so on. And even worse, I didn't notice for quite a bit that actually on my machine, for whatever reason, LLDB had ASLR enabled by default. And so each time I was running it, it was crashing at a different address. And if you stared at like hex addresses for 10 hours, you stop seeing that they are changing. And I just checked the first bytes and I was just like, what's going on? This code was different, the last run and so on. Yeah, triaging this is not fun, let's just say that. Um, and so in the end, we still wanted to know what's going on. And so we started to customize the just, the just in time compiler to basically, on one hand, give us the raw x86 uh, binary, then give us a map of the eBPF instructions that caused it. And so we basically automatically annotated the eBPF instructions in Ghidra to be able to see, okay, what may have caused this. Um, spent hours and hours analyzing this and found multiple out-of-bound reads and out-of-bound writes and so on. And again, we didn't care too much about exploitability, we just cared that they are there. So I can't tell you whether this would be somehow exploitable in the wild um, on the VM. But we wanted to at least try, you know, on a test chain to somehow get our validator to crash from the chain side. And this is again one of these, these points where you really should have read the entire code before you start fuzzing and get too excited about vulnerabilities. Because it turns out that the BPF runtime contains something called a program verifier. And that program verifier happens to catch basically all our crashes. So we have vulnerabilities in the VM, but they are not exploitable on chain. So this lowered kind of this severity for us quite a bit, but we still had some nice vulnerabilities. And so let's still, we need to go through disclosure. We submitted this talk, like we did this early in the year, started disclosure and so on, and on the 1st of May we submitted to DEF CON. On the 11th of May we basically got uh, an email by the DEF CON review board saying, hey, is this your blog post? And so it turns out that Edison from Secret Club basically fussed exactly the same VM as we, uh, using a different fuzzer and found, obviously, because it's pretty straightforward, basically the same things we found 
some memory corruption vulnerabilities, and we basically had a full bug collision with Secret Club. The patch version fixed all our uh, all our phone vulnerabilities, and we just told the review board, "Hey, um, we didn't know about this, but this is not us, but it's very similar to what we do." And um, yeah, that was kind of a sad day. Congrats to Secret Club, 200k bounty is pretty nice, <laughs> and our fuzzer is basically not useless, but yeah, it only finds floating point exceptions now. Um, but yeah, I mean, sad, but. In the end, we still learned a lot. We still have a lot of takeaways. Um, first off, just-in-time compilers are really uh, a lot of fun to fuss. It's pretty cool because you have a lot of different pieces. Um, they're pretty easy to fuss, which was kind of surprising to me because I always kind of considered it a bit dark magic because, you know, you hear about all these people fuzzing um, JavaScript, via, uh, virtual machines, and so on. Turns out, with a small JIT, it's actually pretty easy. Triaging it, however, is pretty difficult and can be pretty pretty annoying. And also performance can really impact security. Sometimes you have to make a decision on whether you want performance or security. In this case, using a just-in-time compiler is somewhere in the middle. It's pretty difficult to get it right. Um, but luckily, like since then, they've added like native fuzzing infrastructure to the whole VM. Um, and I think, it, yeah, it's pretty secure by now. Also, if you find a vulnerability, don't get super excited. Verify that it's actually exploitable in the wild. And unfortunately, bug collisions happen. And uh, yeah, that's all I have for you today. I hope you like this. Thanks a lot. And, yeah. Cool. Hope you enjoyed DEF CON and see you next year, hopefully. <laughs>